Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm not going to waste too much time here uh, introducing or going over th anything. I'm going to jump into the presentation. Um, hopefully, Julia will help me with questions as we go along, and I'll do my best to answer them. So let me get my screen share. Give me one more second. OK. So uh, I'm going to go over a presentation here that just kind of introduces the basics of composting, how to compost, best practices, as well as touching on um, the best practices for your biological soil amendments of animal origin, um, that Dave did a great job of introducing a lot of these topics in his last <clears throat> uh, presentation here. So basics of composting. Uh, composting is a controlled aerobic decomposition of organic matter by microorganisms into a stable hummus-like soil amendment, and that definition is provided by NRCS. Composting is a natural process of organic decomposition, and all of the living organisms that engage in this decomposition process are natively present in the environment. Similar to other living systems, this decomposition process <clears throat> are impacted by their habitat. So for proper composting, really what you wanna do is you wanna just create the perfect ecosystem for these microorganisms to thrive in. And by creating this proper ecosystem, it allows them to replicate and produce at their most optimum rate. Uh, conversely, if the habitat is suboptimal, it can inhibit the life cycle and the desired composting microorganisms reproduction. Um, the primary ingredients for composting are your organic material. So carbon and nitrogen are provided by your organic material. And the carbon and nitrogen, it's critical that you get them in your proper carbon to nitrogen ratios. You'll hear me talk about that quite a bit throughout this presentation. Um, and we'll go into those ratios later. Um, but uh, the other two main components for getting your composting ecosystem right is uh, oxygen provided by air, which is necessary because composting is an aerobic uh, system, so it needs oxygen for these microorganisms to reproduce, and water and moisture. The composting organisms need some water in order to be active. Um, however, if too much water is present, it can decrease the pore space within the compost, um, which creates anaerobic conditions. And your primary microorganisms in composting are going to be your bacteria, your actinomycetes, your fungi, um, and also as well as worms um, and a few other uh, primary decomposers. Um, all of these are encompassed in what's called the composting food web. So your compost food web, as you can see here to the right, um, is basically just like any other food web, but focused just in your composting life cycle. So your primary decomposers at the bottom, let me get my little spotlight on here. Your primary decomposers at the bottom here are gonna be your actinomycetes, your fungi, your bacteria, which directly break down your organic matter via chemical decomposition. While your primary decomposers like earthworms, sow bugs, and millipedes, as well as fly larvae, consume the dead organic matter and break it down via physical decomposition. Your secondary decom decomposers um, come in and consume the primary decomposers when the, when the conditions are right. Typically, the early part of the composting process is dominated by primary chemical decomposers with high levels of organisms only coming in to feed in the later part of the process. This process is part of what can be considered the composting life cycle. Typically, when all of the ingredients are present to create the optimal habitat, the mesophilic bacteria will colonize the, composting, the compost within a few days. As the mesophilic bacteria feed and reproduce, the temperatures within the pile will increase. Mesophilic bacteria are active from 50 degrees Fahrenheit to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. As the compost temperature approach and exceeds 120 degrees, thermophilic organisms will take over as the primary decomposing colony within the compost. Thermophilic organisms are most active from 120 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. At this temperature range, the decomposition process occurs much more rapidly. 
Also, if these elevated temperatures are sustained, it can produce the effect that substantially decreases pathogens and weed seeds within the compost. After an unspecified period of time, based on the conditions and the organic energy available, the compost pile will begin to cool down, allowing for non-thermophilic decomposers to enter the system. At this warm but not hot stage, much of the compost has been broken down into components that are ideal for fungi, actinomyces, and protozoa will begin to move in and feed on the established bacterial colonies. During this stage, the fungi and actinomyces are able to break down the tough cellular materials like cellulose and lignans that are still present in the compost. As the compost cycle progresses, the natural succession of organisms and decomposers will continue. It is important to continue to remember that compost is a living ecosystem that is subject to a wide variability across location and time. Creating your composting environment. Ingredients. As previously discussed, there are specific ingredients that are needed to be present in order to create an ideal composting environment. Similar to baking a cake, it is important that the ingredients are used in proper ratios in order to create a desirable outcome. The optimal carbon to nitrogen ratio is between 25 and 30 to 1. So that would be 20, 25 to 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. This ratio has been proven to be optimal for feedstock composting and for feeding the microorganisms. However, composting can still occur from a wider range of 15 to one to 40 to one, although it is less optimal. <clears throat> In order for aerobic composting to occur, there must be at least 5% oxygen. The more oxygen available, the more active the aerobic microbiome will be. Typically, there will be variable oxygen levels throughout a compost pile where areas that are directly exposed to air will have more oxygen available and the interior or isolated areas will have less oxygen. If the oxygen levels at these isolated area falls below 5%, then the location can begin to harbor anaerobic microorganisms and composting will not occur. And anaerobic decomposition is a totally different process that we're not gonna touch on today, um, at least in this presentation. Um, air has an ambient oxygen has, has uh, an ambient level of oxygen of 20.9, and the moisture content um, also is critical for composting environment. The ideal moisture content is going to be between 40 to 65%, with the ideal percent falling in between those two numbers. <clears throat> Additionally, if the moisture content raises much above 65%, then this is going to cause what I mentioned earlier, where the there's too much water in the compost and it outcompetes oxygen and creates anaerobic conditions. Successful indicators. When all of the ingredients are present in the right amount, there are indicators which can be used to show that the composting process is successfully underway. One is that thermophilic reactions begin. And this thermophilic activity can be confirmed using a compost thermometer or just sensory perception. If the thermophilic pasteurization is part of your composting goal, then a thermometer should be utilized, which we're gonna talk about later for your biological soil amendments of animal origin. That, that thermophilic pasteurization is, is such a critical part of creating a treated compost um, that, that having a compost thermometer with you and on hand is, is really invaluable. Um, <clears throat> other, other metrics include uh, a visible reduction in quantity, um, which just shows that the composting process is happening and that carbon content is being released into the air via CO2. Um, and then a few other things just to test, um, as Dave kind of mentioned earlier, you have your different levels of finished compost and your different levels of compost. Um, some people take it to a whole nother level where they do some microscopic examination of their compost. They wanna know what type of micro microbes are in there, whether they're pathogens, um, or maybe they're looking for a specific um, funga, fungal content in their compost. Additionally, when you're looking at mature compost, um, and this is for a lot of farmers, you have to be careful when you're applying compost that's immature, it's still changing. And um, if you did a nutrient test on a unfinished compost, it's, its levels and pH and things are variable and they're gonna continue to change over time. 
So in terms of farmers applying compost and using compost in a specific way, um, having a cured and finished compost um, is best. And it can take several weeks or even months to get to that stable, um, that stable uh, <clears throat> uh, level, but it's definitely recommended for consistency. Um, some of the tests that can be performed um, on this stable compost are uh, there's different type of assays um, that can be used to check for emissions to see if your compost is done uh, producing CO2 um, or ammonia, as well as uh, germination tests, which is just you put in kind of tough to sprout seeds, uh, typically maybe like a watercress or uh, something like that. You'll put it into your compost, and if it sprouts, then you know you have a, a stable um, product. <clears throat> creating a composting environment, practical application. While it is important to know the desired C to N ratio, oxygen percent and moisture percent, it isn't necessarily that applicable to practical compost management. So what does C to N ratio really mean? All the organic matter, all organic matter has a specific molecular composition that will dictate a range of ratios in which the carbon and nitrogen exists within that material. These material specific ratios can be found in lookup tables that will typically display a list of materials with a wide range of C to N ratios. On the right here, you can see a lookup table that I pulled from Cornell's composting website. Uh, in this table, you'll see it's split up into high carbon con um, inputs such as straw, wood chips, bark, high carbon, and high nitrogen, which is gonna be your manures, your grass clippings, vegetable scraps, Anything essentially that falls below 20 to one is gonna be considered a high nitrogen. Um, other lists, they may list these off as maybe your greens and your browns. Um, it's really the same thing. Your browns are your high car carbon and your greens are your high nitrogen. As previously discussed, oxygen levels within a single pile can be highly variable based on location's ability um, to have direct contact with air, or if the areas are confined, confined areas may become anaerobic. Because of this, there are various methods that can be utilized to increase the oxygen available to compost. There are three primary methods for increasing oxygen within a compost pile. One is forced aeration, the second is passive aeration, and the third is moving material. Um, Finally, uh, we'll talk, touch on this later, is judging your moisture content. So creating your aerated compost environment. A lack of aeration can significantly slow or stall the composting process. When managing compost, it is important to try to ensue that all the areas within the compost have access to oxygen. This will help create a more uniform composting process. And there are various methods and tactics that can be utilized to increase the oxygen available in the composting to composting microorganisms. One method is called forced aeration. This technique utilizes air pumps to help aerate the unexposed interior areas of the compost pile. The pumps can either be positively forced air into the compost or negatively pull air from the center of the pile, causing more air to be drawn in through the outer surface. Here you can see a diagram of these two different methods. And essentially in these methods, um, you're using a physical source, a pump to supply extra air into the pile. Um, it limits your, your man hours needed um, for turning the pile, but it does add more moving parts. So here you can see um, the demonstration of a negative pressure aeration where air is coming out, going through a carbon filter, and it's pulling air through the, through the exterior cap while this positive pressure is just a perforated pipe running underneath the pile, this would be a windrow pile um, and pumping air to the unexposed interior. And we're gonna touch more on these later, um, but this specific system would be called uh, an aerated static pile or ASP for short. Um, and we'll go in to this more later in how the regulations um, differ for these static type piles. Um, another type of static pile would be a passively aerated pile. Similar to forced aeration, perforated pipe runs through the center of the compost pile in order to help aerate the confined interior region. However, in this method, no pump is used, 
and the method of aeration relies on the force created by convective heating to passively circulate air from hotter to colder regions of the compost pile. On the bottom right, you will see that there is a diagram displaying how convective heat can circulate air through a pile. So essentially, it's just your hot air is going to rise. So you try to just use that natural force to guide air in and let it rise up into the, into the tougher to reach places of the pile here. Um, the final aeration tactic is physically moving and agitating the composting pile. <clears throat> this strategy will often be called turning. Compost turning is an effective way to break up anaerobic regions and produce a uniform compost product. The frequency of the compost turning is variable, and depending on the size, inputs, design, and management goals, the turning frequency can range from daily, weekly, monthly, or even more. However, it is important to remember that large piles that become compacted have a higher interior risk of becoming anaerobic, and that additionally, excess turning can often lead to excessive heat loss and moisture dissipation. So here is some math that we're not going to go into today. This is a simplified version, but essentially to get your proper ratios um, for your C to N ratio, which creates that optimal composting ecosystem that we talked about, um, you'll have to calculate your inputs. Um, typically, you're looking at a two or a three input system, and your inputs need to be calculated based on what your primary input might be. The C to N ratio, for example, here is a poultry carcass um, so for mortality composting would be a five to one. And wood shavings, you need to counterbalance this with your wood shavings at a 300 to 1. So we're not going to go into the math today because we have a nice uh, Excel tool that does all the math for you at the end of this um, that I'll go into. So here's the bit, the more complicated math version. If you're interested in this, um, I can share this with you. Um, Cornell has a very good step-by-step -step kind of walk you through how to do each of the algebraic parts of this equation, um, but we're not going to go into that today. Um, here are some additional calculations from the on-farm composting handbook, which I recommend. It's just the kind of baseline standard for, for how to compost on-farm, and it's very detailed. Um, this will teach you how to do moisture calculations, and this will teach you how to do um, additional ingredients in your calculation. Uh, continuing on with our practical application, we have our moisture hand squeeze test. So this is something that I love because it's uh, very easy for everybody to wrap their head around. And I know a lot of these numbers can kind of get to you, you know, 40% moisture, 65% moisture, what does that really mean? But essentially, um, with just a little bit of practice, um, you can figure out your moisture content of your mix and your compost just with the squeeze of your own hand. And, and here's the step-by-step -step guide. But essentially, if you pick up a pile of, of compost or soil and you grab it and it just crumbles and falls out of your hand, then it's likely below 45% moisture, which is gonna be below what you want for optimal moisture content. Um, if you grab it and it sticks together and it creates a ball and it kind of holds its shape, that's exactly what you're looking for. And that's gonna be right here in this kind of 50 to 60 range. Um, and if you pick up some compost or, or, or other material, pre-compost mix material, and you squeeze it and, and any water comes out or if streaming water comes out, then you know your, your carbon con your moisture content is too high and you're gonna need to add some bulking um, material to soak up some of that moisture. So just kind of final thoughts on practicality here. Um, I know I went over a lot of numbers and percentages and temperatures and, and everything, but don't be intimidated. Um, anybody can compost. It's, uh, it's a natural process, like I said, and all of these things want to occur naturally. You're, all of these specifics that we're going into are just about kind of stewarding in the most efficient process of composting. But it, as long as the conditions are right and, and there's oxygen and, and water available and composting is going to occur. And if you make a mistake and you're, you don't hit your temperatures that you want or your pile goes anaerobic and you can tell by the smell, you know, you can fix these problems. Um, you can reintroduce more water. You can re-aerate your pile, and, and it'll likely just start right back up again where it left off. So um, 
as much as I like to get into the details of, of the right way, the most efficient way to do it, um, I really want to encourage everybody on here um, that you can do it at home and that, that composting is, is not, it's not rocket science. It's just, uh, it's just soil science. So um, I hope that didn't insult anybody here, but it's, it's, uh, it's really not something to be intimidated by. Um, so now getting into some of these details about on-farm composting of your biological soil amendments of animal origin. So I would say the two primary sources that uh, I'm going to see or that, that farmers are going to run into are going to be mortality and manure. Um, and although they're different, both of them are still uh, regulated the same under subpart F. So the treatment for how to create a treated compost is going to be the same rules for both of these two sources. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, track your temperatures. If you want to get a treated compost and you want to be conf confident in it, track your temperatures um, and have a dedicated thermometer that you use for it and log your temperatures. Um, it's not hard to do. Most farmers are record keeping anyways, just a daily log of what your temperature is and then you can be confident that you hit those right numbers. And you can apply it in the ways that that was talked about in the previous presentation um, based on if you can get a treated compost, it'll give you some more variability of application. Um, so, uh, Dave, uh, Dr. Ingram um, touched on both of these numbers. I just want to reiterate because they're important. So, your static composting system, such as your ASP, your aerated static piles, or any type of static pile, is only going to require three consecutive days of compost temperatures greater than 131 degrees Fahrenheit. However, your static pile must be properly built in order for this to be applicable. The most critical factor when building a static pile is to ensure adequate pathogen, to ensure adequate pathogen reduction is creating an external insulated barrier. Since the pile is not being turned, untreated compost on the exterior of the pile will not undergo thermophilic pathogen reduction. It is typically recommended to use at least six inches of carbon material or finished compost to encapsulate a static pile. However, um, if you utilize an in-vessel composter or a bin system, some of the framing can count towards that insulated area. So essentially, it's just common sense that the outside of the pile isn't going to get as hot as the inside of the pile. So if you're not turning it and creating that hot, homogenous mix, and you really want to make sure that, that you, these three consecutive days of, of temperatures are giving you your pathogen reduction, you need to have that insulating cap. Um, and that's for that's for the sides, the top, the bottom, you know, depending on if you're doing a windrow or a bin type system. Um, your turn compost, such as turned windrows or a turned bin system, require 15 consecutive days of, with temperatures greater than 131 degrees. Um, and then just some additional considerations uh, when you're handling any type of uh, manure, mortality, and even the finished compost, you want to consider your runoff and leachate. Uh, are you on a concrete pad? Are you on a, a dirt pad? What's your roofing structure? What's your protection from rainfall? Um, all of those things are things you want to consider. Are you um, uphill of, of crops that could be contaminated by runoff? Um, or are you completely covering it from the rain, which is ideal, um, as well as having it on a concrete pad is also recommended. Um, and then just like Dr. Inger mentioned before, how are you stacking? Where are you stacking? Are you stacking um, next to an untreated pile because you don't want to recontaminate your treated compost with untreated manure? So think about your storage, think about your placement, do all of this ahead of time so you don't have to worry about moving stuff after. Um, additional considerations when you're talking about mortality and manure, obviously you have odors. Um, you know, be considerate of, of your odors and how that may affect other people um, with compost. Putting that carbon cap and compost cap really helps with odors. Um, and then also vectors. Um, are you limiting things that can get in and spread um, these pathogens before it gets treated? Especially with mortality, um, anybody that's worked with it knows, you know, you have to watch out for mice and raccoons and birds and anything coming in um, to try to pick at and spread those pathogens around. So mortality composting. Routine mortality is a natural part of raising livestock. 
On-farm mortality composting can be a safe and effective way to deal with normal livestock mortality. On-farm mortality composting is established in order to handle daily or routine mortality, but is typically not recommended or intended to process a catastrophic mortality event. A farm's mortality compost system is designed to handle an expected range of mortality load rates, and exceeding that range for catastrophic events can significantly disrupt the composting process. So when you're planning your on-farm compost, if you're a livestock farmer, um, you're, you're planning it, you're sizing it, your specs are going to be for your expected um, routine mortality, and that's what your size should be. Um, and also, you should size it based on your maximum expected load rates. Um, I've done some research into um, averages versus maximum, and especially for the research I did, which was on broiler farms, um, because, because your mortality doesn't come linearly across your flock, you need to plan and size for your largest expected um, mortality rate and not just an average because it needs to be able to handle, you need to be able to handle uh, your highest daily inputs in order to not overload your system with excess uh, nitrogen content. Um, so the composting process, uh, you know, it includes these really high dense material, high density materials like meat, hide, feather, and bones. Um, and all of these carry an increased risk, risk of uh, containing pathogen, pathogens. Um, <clears throat> so um, when you're doing these type of high risk things, you just wanna be extra careful about managing your ratios, your time and, and, and recording your temperatures. And for mortality, there's a couple of different methods that you might employ. Uh, the two most popular methods that I've seen um, are going to be your bin compost systems and your in vessel systems. Um, your bin compost systems, like you can see here, this is a simple three bin system. Um, this is a, a great system. It's covered, it's on a concrete pad, um, and he's built its specs with his little front end loader here so that he can just go in, easily turn his piles, has easy access to turn each pile. Um, so in this type of system, typically the mortality um, is going to be surrounded with a carbon bulking additive on the bottom and the sides uh, to kind of contain it. And uh, there should be a bottom layer as well as a top layer to help keep your vectors out and contain your odors. Um, so, um, that's that's basic bin composting system. We can go more into that later. But uh, this over here is a specific type of in-vessel system, um, which are also sometimes called rotary or drum composters. Uh, this style composter contains all of the mortality within a vessel, which aids in mixing and preventing off-site contamination and odors. In-vessel systems still require the proper seed and ratios of inputs. However, since they're self-contained, they're less prone to excess moisture loss. So typically you get your mix right in here and it stays. Um, and these bin systems, you're more likely to have to add extra moisture every time you turn it to just kind of help keep your ratios proper. Um, so here's uh, an in-vessel system that I've worked with before. Um, and I'm just gonna go into a little bit about these. So uh, these in-vessel composters can be very effective in handling your daily mortality as long as you size them for your expected uh, daily quantity. Um, there's two different types. You could have a continuous or batch method. Um, the bath, batch method works. It introduces more complications because you're essentially saving up your feedstock until you have enough to do one pasteurized batch at a time. Um, I kind of prefer these continuous style ones, which is what this is here, where you have your daily mortality and your daily carbon content and you add it in. Um, and in these type of systems, uh, the rotations directly correlate to the speed at which the material is released from the drum. So more rotations push, push it through the system faster. But that's also how you get your uh, mixing. It's how you get your air into the system. And it's how you get uh, a homogenous mix at the end. <clears throat> So 
I think that's all. I'll take any questions. If, if you have any any questions about these type of systems, just ask me and I'll, I'll touch more on them. But uh, I've seen these used for um, broiler farms for mortality. I've seen them used for swine farms and they do work, um, but you do need to be careful in assuming that what comes out of these systems are a treated process. Um, and it's not 100% that everything that, that, that these composters are gonna produce a, are gonna produce your temperatures that are required for pathogen reduction. Um, and then quickly just touching on manure composting. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a wide range of sources as, as any farmer knows, and these wide range of sources are poultry litter, you know, swine manure, horse manure, um, and each of these have their own specific values. They each have their own specific nutrient content, moisture content, and bulk density. Um, you can find a lot of these in what we would call book values, kind of those tables that I showed you earlier. But I would really recommend is that you get, if, if you're a livestock farmer or you have access to a lot of uh, manure product, and you're going to, whether you're going to use this product raw or you're going to use it uh, to create compost, we'd really recommend that you get it tested and that you have your specific um, nutrient contents, your carbon percent, your nitrogen percent, uh, your moisture percent, your pH and, and bulk density and everything for your product. Um, and once you have that, you don't need to test it every time. It just gives you a good general idea of a starting point for what you're going to use. So um, I recommend that, that you get it tested. You can send it off to the U of A to get your nutrient tests done. Um, and uh, additional considerations are just going to be like we talked about earlier with, with any type of um, soil amendment of animal origin. It's going to be your odors, your runoff, your leachate. And additionally, um, there are some concerns with um, herbicides and pesticides. It's, it's a pretty specific case. But with certain things um, like horse manure and cow manure, there are herbicides that are used to treat, for example, broadleaf plants in the grazing fields that pass right through their systems um, and they can continue to be persistent in their um, manure and then still persistent in their compost. Um, it's a pretty specific case and if you have more questions about it, um, I can try to answer them, but it's something to be aware of that, that gets run into every now and then is that people have this compost and they can't grow their produce in it because these pesticides or these herbicides persist through the manure and um, composting process. Um, so that is all I have. It looks like I'm doing pretty good on time. So I'm gonna jump into this compost tool. Um, I'll show you, um, let me see. We have about 10 minutes before we'll take a break. Okay, am I, am I are y'all seeing the Excel sheet here? Yes, we are. Okay, good. I'm just Can making you zoom sure it out my... a little bit? Yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah. Okay, so this, uh, so this nifty tool here, it's in Excel. Uh, I'm working on getting it converted into a web app so that anybody can use this that doesn't necessarily have Microsoft Office. Um, I also have a Google Sheets version, which is uh, free for anybody to use. And I can give you access if you just wanna email me after this and you're interested in it. So I've got a lot of instructions here that we don't need to read because that's for people that aren't getting it explained to them. So essentially what we're looking at here uh, is a tool that's gonna help you calculate your ratios, uh, your moisture content based on a two input system. So simple guidelines is green, you have to enter in the value, yellow, you select your value from a drop-down menu, and red is auto-populated. So here at the top, we have our two inputs. We have our primary input and our carbon input. Uh, the one I have pre-populated here is broiler litter. Um, all of these values are drawn from a table that's built in to the tool here. Um, so these values are all here. Your moisture content, your C to N ratio, which we talked about, your bulk density, and then wood shavings, uh, soft wood shavings, which is a pretty popular uh, carbon input because a lot of farmers can get it for next to nothing um, if not for free. Um, so here I'll just show you I can I can change to different values here. For example, 
cattle manure and it's going to auto populate different values here. And, you know, I can change the straw and it's going to populate different values here. So, um, Um, another thing that's important to note here, I have a couple useful things that are built in. Um, so this reset formula button, let's say you have specific values um, for your cattle manure and you know what they are because you did a soil test. You can just come in here and you can enter in your different contents here. Um, maybe yours is 20, maybe your bulk density is higher. So you can enter these in, it's going to change your calculations. But if you ever mess anything up, you can just come right here and, and click the reset button. And it's going to reset all of these formulas to their baseline. So you can just reset these and change whatever you want. Additionally, um, I added in an extra tab here. If you do do your own soil tests, you can come over to this lookup table here. Um, so this is, the, this is where it pulls all the values from. And this is numbers from that published on Farm Composting Handbook. Um, not all of these values are filled out. Um, so if there's blanks, you may have to enter them in yourself from other sources online. Uh, additionally, at the bottom, there's this place where you can input your own custom um, numbers. So if you just came down here and you entered these in, then you could save them for later and you wouldn't have to re-enter them in every time. So um, you can enter them in right here, go back to your input calculations tab, and those are just right at the top. Um, input, custom input one, two, three, and four. So that's kind of how that drop down works. So here you can see, for example, this blood waste um, from a slaughterhouse. It doesn't have a specific bulk density. You would have to maybe go online and look that up yourself. Um, anyways, back to this example. So you're a broiler farmer and you have a specific amount of broiler litter. How much? So let's come down here and see what we need to know. So here we have our important user inputs. So your primary input, which is your broiler litter, how much do you have? So hopefully you have an idea. Um, let's just say that you have um, one, let's just say you have 10 or 11, we'll go, we'll just say you have 11. Okay, what's your gallons? What do you have? Are you a large farmer or do you have 11 cubic yards? So you have a lot, let's say. So that changes. So Essentially, how this tool works is you put in your primary input. Um, so your primary, whether it's mortality or manure or whatever your primary input is, you put it in, and it's going to tell you how much carbon material you need to balance to get your proper ratio. So here, I told it I have 11 cubic yards of poultry litter. Um, OK, so that's so I need to come over here, and I need to tell it, well, what's my desired C to N ratio? So like we talked about before, our optimal range is going to be you know, 25 or maybe 30. So, and, and you're going to have to play with these numbers some. Additionally, what's your desired moisture content? Um, like we said, you know, somewhere between that 50 to 65 range. Um, let's go for 55 because boiler litter is kind of dry. Um, and it may have, to, may have to add a lot of water to get it up to like a 65. So these are your primary inputs. Um, I think most farmers are going to know their volume of their primary inputs. If you don't, there's a conversion here if you happen to know what your weight is, um, and this will just convert your known weight um, based on the bulk density or convert it into volume for you. So here, um, this will just convert it, and it's not tied into the rest. This just converts how much 100 pounds of poultry litter is in cubic yards. So we'd probably be closer to like um, even more. So we'd be closer to like around 10,000 pounds. A poultry litter equals this 11 um, cubic yards. So that's that's mostly, those are all of the inputs that you have to do. The only thing you have to type in here, you have to select your, your sources here or fill them in yourself based on your soil tests. Um, enter in your quantity, enter in your desired C to N ratio, and enter in your desired moisture content. And then you just have to come down here and select what's your frequency. Are you, is this 11 cubic yards happening every day? Is this 11 cubic yards happening every week? Or is it happening every month? So um, I'm going to select daily. Obviously, that's a lot of quantity. But um, 
this, this tool, I guess I skipped over the beginning. This tool, in addition to doing all the calculations for you, it also is designed to help you build a bin composting um, system. So the bin system, which I showed you a picture of earlier, is just multiple bins laid out. It's, it's a, essentially a management strategy um, that allows you to track where your finished compost is, where your active compost is, and where your active pile is. Um, and those bins are designed to be moved or separated based on their stage. So essentially, when you fill up a bin, you want it to have three months of composting time without having to touch it. Um, and, and those or three months of time until it would be considered finished at the earliest. So when those bins are finished, um, this, this tool is helping you calculate how much volume you're going to produce and how many, how much volume you need in those bins to accommodate your quantity of volume, if that makes sense. So here we entered in daily. We come down here and this is telling us, based on our inputs, how much moisture are we going to need to add? So the current moisture content of this mix, of this mix of 11 cubic yards of broiler to and six cubic yards of, uh, of uh, wood shavings. So that mix is only at 27% moisture. So in order to get to our desired moisture of 55, you're gonna have to add 665 gallons of water. So like I said, you can kind of play with these numbers a little bit. So maybe that seems like too much water. You don't wanna add that much water. Well, maybe we bring this down to just 50 instead. Okay, well, that means I only have to add 700 gallons of water now. Um, and, and remember that this is also a very dry mix. Uh, like if you're using swine manure or cow manure, it's going to be a much higher moisture content than this 37% right here. Um, so that, that's all you need to balance it. And, and all of this is balancing it for you. So essentially, here's what you're looking at. This is what I'm putting in. This is my desired amount. This is how much I need to balance my carbon. And this is how much water I need to get to my optimal uh, moisture content. So these are your target numbers right here for your, for your two part mix. And then you come down here and this is gonna show you, this is your total weekly input. So that's how much volume based on those numbers is going, you're producing per week. So you have to size your bin systems based on that. So the final part of this tool here is we're gonna go over to our, our uh, bin composting specs tool. So essentially you're gonna say in feet, how big do I wanna build my bins? Um, so a height of six feet seems reasonable. Okay, depth, um, we can go also six feet and maybe a length of six feet. We'll just go a six by six box here. And how many bins do I have? Three bins. So this tells me my bin volume. Um, this right here tells me um, in cubic yards, right? And then this is the minimum volume required based on our inputs in the previous, um, on the previous sheet. So this is how much we need. We're not even close, right? So obviously we're doing a very high quantity based on those cubic yards. So this, uh, this will automatically turn green when we get to the right amount. So let's say maybe we keep it at six feet of height and maybe we go to, um, 15 feet of depth and um, 15 feet of length, and maybe we increase it to eight bins, um, or let's go nine bins. Oh, I right, I don't have that many bins programmed in six. So, Well, so <laughs> I, I put in a, a very high volume, which I, if you were had, in, in, in hindsight, if you were processing this amount of volume, you probably wouldn't be doing bins. You'd probably be doing a windrow. So let's just bump this down to, to cu cubic yards. So that's per day. Um, I could have just, I could just change this per week. We'll go back to 10. Um, so there we go. So that should give us uh, better numbers here. So. So as we can see, okay, so this number automatically changes um, to let you know if it's higher than this number, essentially, which is your required volume. So, f 
50, this is how much volume you're going to get in this system with six bins. So I know I kind of ran through this and it probably seems like a lot, but I think the best thing um, is for you to go, if you want to use this tool, um, play with it. Uh, the whole point is to make it easier for you to do those kind of complex calculations. Um, and, and it's just going to spit out your numbers. It's going to spit out how much carbon input you need, how much moisture you need to add, and give you a general idea of planning for how much volume and size you're going to have to accommodate for your known um, manure or mortality uh, amount that you're getting. And I think I'm running up on my time here. So uh, I will take any questions um, if anybody's still awake. All right. Well, thank you, Eric. If we have any questions, we can take those um, just a minute or so, and then we'll take a break. Um, are there any questions? 